Women Taking the Lead, Episode 60. I think you have to have a very select and very well vetted group of people who really get to speak into your life. I do believe in seeking counsel and having people kind of help us understand ourselves better, coaches, mentors. And so that's a that's a way to decide. But yeah, is I think all women can relate to those words, the war within. Hello, my name is Jody Flynn and welcome to Women Taking the Lead, where we are all about creating blasts of inspiration to help you overcome self-doubt so you can lead with confidence, integrity, and a sense of humor. This episode is sponsored by Luma Coaching. Want some support to get your dreams off the ground? Go to womentakingthelead.com forward slash coaching to sign up for a consultation with me. Now, your future awaits, so let's get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm here with Susie Miller, known internationally as the Better Relationship Coach. She's an author, speaker, and coach. Susie is dedicated to helping you create better personal and professional relationships in 30 days or less. Susie equips high potential entrepreneurs and executives to reduce stress, improve communication, and most importantly, not bankrupt their relationships in pursuits of profits so they truly can maximize their success. Susie has been featured in major news outlets, including Forbes, Fox News, Entrepreneur, and is the best-selling author of Listen, Learn, Love, How to Dramatically Improve Your Relationship in 30 Days or Less. Susie has been married to John for 32 years. Congratulations. And they have three adult children. Okay, Susie, that's a little something for everyone, but tell us more about you and your own humble beginnings. Uh, Thanks for having me, Jody. I'm so glad to be here and excited to talk to you today. I'm a big fan of women taking the lead, and so to be on your show is great. My humble beginnings, let's see. You know, I started, I feel like I should start like that old Steve Martin commercial. I was born a poor black child. (laughs) (laughs) And that's terrible to say now. And I actually am a mixed race uh, woman, and my dad was from India, my mom's American. And so I started, you know, kind of just as one of a bunch of kids who you know, thought that life was about going to school, getting a good job, earning your way, um, or being a wife and mom. And I knew that I wanted to be a wife and mom. And that was kind of my first priority. I loved that. That's what my mom did. And I'm, I'm a little older than you. So that kind of puts me in a different generation at one level. And so I married young, we had kids young, and I loved what I was doing. I was the volunteer queen, because clearly I wanted to do something more. And so like, I love being a wife and mom, and I wanted to do more than that or and have my own thing that was just me. And so I volunteered. I did this. I did that. And eventually, my husband looked at me and said, why don't you go back to school and go ahead and get the, your, you know, your therapist degree and start working with people while because our kids were old enough that they were in school during the day. And he was an entrepreneur, so he worked from home so we could really juggle one of us always being there. So that's how I got started in this and then was a therapist for a number of years kind of got cancer, kind of got cancer, got cancer, which really (laughs) changes your life. And from there, I made the transition into marriage and relationship coaching versus therapy, because honestly, the best part about the difference between coaching and counseling is you can be friends with your coaching clients and counseling clients. You have to treat like you would a doctor's office visit. Very, very arm's length. My goodness. Yeah, it definitely is a a different relationship being a coach because and some people are like, really, you can become friends with your clients. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, like you're partnering with them. Right, right, right. There's there's no like I can't cross ethical boundaries. Now, there there are ethics to coaching. Absolutely. Right? It's, the, it's the client's agenda that's running the show yeah. and, you know, amongst other things. But you definitely get involved with your clients. So and it's really and nice so- because you can have a relationship with them, you know, outside the office. You know, when you go to, as a therapist, you know, I remember people would see me and I wouldn't say hello to them first. And finally I had to prep them and go, I will not say hello to you first in public because that's a breach of confidentiality. You might not want the person to know you're in therapy, but literally I've been in Starbucks and somebody goes, there's Susie, there's my coach, come meet her, you know? (laughs) And so that was really uh, fun. When my book came out, which um, was in May and it hit the Amazon bestseller list, I was able to have a book party here and my clients could come and they could never come if it had been just my therapy clients. So leaving that behind has been one of the best things I've ever done. It's a very cool transition. And so Susie, clearly, you know, you're talking about your book and the success you've had in your life. You definitely have gained confidence over the years, but I'm interested in a time when you were playing small and you may not have been aware of it at the time. Tell with the, tell us the story 
and the lessons you've learned from that? You know, Jody, that's a great question. And I have more than one story. So I have to think, <laughs> as I was thinking about prepping for our interview, because you're so organized, you send out prep. I was like, which story shall I tell? And, you know, my thought is we share to help other people. We want our stories, what we live through, to help either equip, empower, inspire other people. And while there's, you know, a lot of things I've lived through, playing small story for me really centers down to one thing. And that was giving way too much weight to what my friends and my circle of people around me thought about who I should be, what I should be like, what I should be doing. And that is part of, again, my kind of going back to my humble beginnings, because there was this idea of I didn't quite have fit into like the norm. You know, I always knew like everybody was quiet. I was loud. Everybody was, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, everybody sat still in church. I was the one who couldn't sit still to save my life. And so there was this idea of and not being different in a special way, although I believe we're all special. It was more of a I don't fit. And it was, you know, the idea was to fit, you had to change, you had to be something different. And so I remember friends saying, you know, can't you be happy being a wife and mom? Why do you want more? Or why can't you settle for this? Or why are you always pushing yourself? And it was this, you know, almost this idea of you're too much. You know, you want too much, you think too much. You know, one of my deepest wounds was being told I talk too much. And, you know, as a speaker, now I've kind of redeemed that. But this idea of, I let that become louder than my own voice, my own internal, you know, God, what I believe God called me to, I have a deep faith, but this whole idea of fitting in and being approved of really came, really became loud in my life. And it made me play small. I kept trying to, you know, kind of dim what I thought I should be. I remember one day looking at my husband and saying, I feel like one of those pressure cookers ready to just burst. And in his wisdom, he said to me, you know, that could be telling you something. You know, it's kind of like, you know, the, the plumber who has leaky pipes, the counselor who doesn't have her own awareness of the fact that, hey, maybe that feeling of something needs to come out is something I should follow. So I began to look at that and look at some of the people I surrounded myself with. And I had an encounter with a girlfriend who just, you know, I met her at an event and she was like, you're amazing. And over time, we became friends. And I thought, wow, what would it be like to have people in my life who thought I was great versus how I should change. And it's not that we don't have room to grow. It's letting people have a louder voice in our lives than what we know the truth to be. Does that make sense? Yes. Oh my gosh. I was just talking with one of the participants in my mastermind a, a few days ago. And she's like, I'm so frustrated because, you know, there's all these things I'm trying to do and I'm getting feedback from people and some of it hurts me, right? Some of it, I, you yeah. know, I don't know what to do with it. She's like, but the advice I'm getting is, either and, and it's it's this was the war within her and the advice she was getting was you know it's none of your business what people think of you and if people are saying it you should pay attention and maybe it's something you should look at she's like so do i ignore it or do i take it to heart right, right? like yes. because and it's kind of both <laughs> it's that moment where you you have to weigh it out and see if it fits see if it's real see if they have an agenda and then you know kind of see their why and somebody older a mentor of mine said to me you know said these words, you got to look at where that's coming from. And it might not be about you at all, you know, and then I think you have to have a very select and very well vetted group of people who really get to speak into your life. I do believe in seeking counsel and having people kind of help us understand ourselves better coaches, mentors. And so that's a, that's a way to decide, but yeah, it is, I think all women can relate to those words, the war within. Yes. Yes. And it's so freeing. Um, when you find people who are like-minded right? Who have similar goals, similar values. And, you know, cause sometimes you're right there, there is room to grow. Like somebody's saying something, they're bringing it to your attention, but with good intentions, mm -hmm. you know, to help you grow as a person. And then sometimes people are just cutting you down cause they're uncomfortable with who they are. Right. Right. So they can't be in your presence cause you make them super uncomfortable. And when people, people feel that way, there's a tendency to lash out and try to make you smaller, right? Yes. So they don't feel uncomfortable in your presence. And it's really when you can clue into what's going on in the situation. Is this person saying this to me because they love me and they have really good intentions for me? Or is this person saying this to me because they're uncomfortable with themselves? Right. Or they're not um, feeling confident. You, they, some people watch you take a step forward and they are not doing that. And so your brave scares them. And so I think at some level, we have to be willing to to pause and really 
listen to our inner our inner voice, listen to the part of us that knows, and not in an arrogant way. I love that quote by Marion Williamson that talks about, you don't do anybody any help by playing small. When you mm. shine, you give other people a chance to shine. And if there's people in your world who aren't liking that, maybe you got to find new people. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say one more thing and um, we can move on. But I, I loved how you said, you know, having that feeling like, am I too much? Mm -hmm. And I think it it's, it, you know, I hear it either way. I hear some women say like, I feel like I'm too much for people. I overwhelm them. And then I hear other people say like, I feel like I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. I feel like I have nothing to offer. Mm -hmm. I feel like I, I can't speak up. So it seems like for women and, you know, I wish I, I had more insight into the thoughts men have. They don't tend to share as much um, openly about what's kind of going on in their mind and the struggles that they're having. Um, maybe it's different for you because you coach around relation yeah. relationships specifically, but I, and I work with a lot of men, so I do get, I do get an inside peek. Yeah. But, you know, anecdotally, my experience is it's women who have those feelings more so than, than men do. I think even if men have them, they're better at compartmentalizing them. So I think about men's minds working like waffles where they can have these little sections and they're all very separate. So if they're having a moment of, of self-doubt or, or, you know, a bad day or whatever, they just kind of put it in the compartment, that little square, and they go to the next square where women are more like spaghetti, everything's interrelated, everything's intertwined. You know, my bad hair day affects my mothering. Her comment makes me feel like I'm not good enough at work. So we we deal with it differently, even if men and men feel it. I think we believe a lot more and everything's intertwined. So one self-doubt can, you know, wiggle its way into our job, our parenting, our relationships, our, you know, how we feel about ourselves. I was looking at some images, the other pictures the other day, because I was doing a collage for my daughter. And I was like, man, I was having one of those, what I call fluffy days. I was feeling less than my felt self usually. And I'm curvy girl anyway, but I remember saying, my husband said, stop calling yourself fat. So my friend and I came up with fluffy and I looked at this picture and there was me with my daughter, you know, 10 years ago. And I was like, man, I looked good. And then I paused and said to my husband, I remember feeling fat in this picture. Oh, yes. Like I remember, and I would love to look that way now, you know, and it's that idea of getting comfortable in your own skin. Being in my fifties, I've kind of gotten to the point where I'm like, this is me world. I don't want to waste any more time trying to make sure other people are happy with me unless, you know, I don't, you know what I mean? I'm not saying, oh, who cares? Mm -hmm. But my circle of friends, my calling, the things I'm supposed to do, because everybody's going to have an opinion. And another piece of advice somebody gave me one time was never take advice from someone you wouldn't be, want to trade places with. So if mm. I don't want your life, I'm not necessarily going to take advice from you. But I do think women, we do have that conditioning and self-doubt and those tapes we play in our head. Oh my God. So true. That was a great insight into men. And also that is the truth that with women, you know, a lot of times it doesn't matter where we are. We, we still don't feel like we're good enough. Like there's always something we still need to do to be better. Um, so we can feel good about ourselves. So, you know, can I tell you one of my big tricks or tips for helping women to kind of embrace that? Oh my God, please. Yes. Okay. So one of my big tips, one of my big coaching tips I use with all my women, even though I do marriages, I do men separately, women separately, and I do couples, is this idea of when you kind of overcome that self-doubt or when you reach a conclusion of I am enough, I've, let's say you said like a woman who is in the lead at a job, she may feel like, I don't know if I have enough to go into this meeting, especially if it's all men. And there's that moment of, wait a minute, I've prepared myself. I, I have the experience. I have the schooling. I have what it takes to do this. And so that self-doubt is answered after you go through all this mental gymnastics by a conclusion. And I tell my clients all the time, get yourself some sticky notes and write down your conclusions. Because if you conclude I'm enough, I'm well prepared, then when all those doubts come, rather than going back through the mental gymnastics, you can go to your sticky note and you can read your conclusion. It takes a whole lot less energy and it keeps you kind of on track. And then I'm like, so, and if you're at work, take a picture of your sticky note. So you have a special little album on your phone, which are the truths and the conclusions you live from. So that you're not taking all that energy to let that self-doubt take root again. Oh, I'm going to try that. Thank you for that, Susie. I, you're welcome. I have sticky notes all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You'll have to snap a picture of it and send it to me so I can see. All right, Susie, now share with us a time in your journey when you had a wake up call. Take us back to that moment and share with us the steps that you took that led to your success. That's a really good question. Let's see. So I've had a number of wake up calls in my life. Um, most of them have been health related. 
a couple of them have been crisis related. And I would say a couple of years ago, I had a massive health wake up call after cancer. So this was, you know, five, seven years past cancer. The doctors had found out that the treatment I had for the cancer had really damaged my lungs, my immune system, and I was chronically ill. And I just kept pushing through, kept pushing through, you know, type A, just I'm fine. And my doctor called me one day, it was a naturopath and a functional medicine doctor, and she said, you are dying on the inside faster than, you know, you look like you're on the outside. So you're at a cellular level, you're not doing well. And we have some, you know, prognosis that's not very promising. So it really stopped me in my tracks. And I was like, okay, I have to take this seriously because I want to live a long time. And I had to juggle my ambition. I had to juggle and deal with the fact that I have these big dreams. I have these big hopes, you know, that are kind of inside of me and I can't get rid of them. I remember praying that God would take them away. I remember trying to convince myself I didn't need to do these things. And I ended up taking a sabbatical and really cutting back on everything. I had a few clients I worked with that were pretty low key, easy, like not high stress. And basically, Jody, I rested. I slept. I binge watched Netflix. Um, I got depressed because I did I wasn't doing anything because to pursue a little would start that spark again. It was like a little bit of a spark of why don't I write a blog would start this whole fire of and then I could do this and this and this and this. And before I knew it, I was you know three quarters down the path. And it was really hard for me to not be who I was and find middle ground. And so the aha moment came as I began to get better and realized kind of I started again and dove all in and kind of kind of had a little bit of relapse was that I didn't have to give up being the hair. I definitely am more like the hair than the tortoise. You know that old story, the mm -hmm. tortoise and the hair. But I had to be a wiser hair. And it really brought a peace to me because I realized I don't have to give up my ambitions. I can work towards my goals in cycles of work and rest. So rather than denying my reality, which was this hard health issue, I could acknowledge that it's real in my life, acknowledge it's something I have to deal with, but deal with it in a way where it wasn't so debilitating. I wasn't fighting against it. It was almost like that old, it might be Taoist comment about kind of when you go in the river, you know, how do you deal with the river? You curl up and you let the river take you. And so I stopped fighting and I really began to kind of say, this is what's true about my life. I have to I can't go great guns. I can't go Mach 10 every day, all day, nor can I pretend that I don't want to. Mm. So what does it look like to go Mach 10 or Mach 7 and then rest? And so that my husband kept saying, just do a little, just be moderate, just be like me. And I, I, I couldn't do it. And I was miserable and I was angry. And so when I realized that moment, I was able to pattern my life in a more what I would call sane way. And it actually led to far more success because I've been healthier. It's been maintained and I'm happy because I'm pursuing my dreams. Mm, I love that Susie, because it can be so hard for us to take a break, right? Cause there's this notion that we're always supposed to be taking care of everybody else. And we're supposed to be going, going, going and doing it all and doing it without breaking a sweat. Right. right, and, right. And, and looking lovely at the mm -hmm. same time while you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And it's so struggle. I think conceptually, most of us understand, yes, we need to rest. We need to take a break. If we get a cold, we should really take a day off. But how many of us actually do it? Right. Right. I mean, and that's the big struggle. And I love how you you really know yourself to know that you go in waves. Oh, it took me a long time <laughs> to know myself. Right. But I'll tell you what happened one day was um, my daughter, our daughter, oldest daughter, who's now in her actually my oldest daughter just turned 30. But she was about so it was about 10 years ago. Um, she was living at home and she was tired after school and she came in and she said, you know, mom, I don't feel good. I just wanted to go lay down. And I was like trying to figure out what was wrong, how she wasn't, you know, what wasn't she feeling good? Actually, it was 15 years ago because she was in high school. And she said, you know, I'm, not, I'm just tired. And it wasn't that something was really wrong. She didn't have the flu. There wasn't sore, you know, throat. She was just tired, but she had not seen me just sit down. For her, she'd only seen me rest when I was sick versus I'm just going to sit and read a magazine. I'm just going to rest and watch a TV show. I'm just going to take a break. And I was actually teaching my daughters that they shouldn't either. And so that was a huge wake up call for me in the moment of I don't want her to feel like she has to, quote unquote, be sick to get a break. I want to model for her that I've done enough. I'm sitting down. I'm, you know, I'm doing I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to not 
be on all the time. And it really shifted how I was as a mom and began to be aware of the messages we give, not just ourselves, but our daughters, our friends, the other women in our world. Mm, I love that being an example to the people around you and the people you love. And I think for women, sometimes that makes it easier for us to do what we know we need to do is, okay, I want them to take care of themselves. So I have to do it for myself to model for them. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. All right, Susie, what I want everyone to get is there is no one way to lead, right? Just like our, <laughs> our ebbs and flows and how we deal with life and what comes at us and the pace we go at, you've been really good articulating that up so far. What, you know, what I want everyone to get is because of that, because we all do things differently, we're going to bring a different style of re leadership forth. So how would you describe your leadership style? You know, you just ask great questions. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Jody. I would say the way I lead most of all is I am kind of a, I'm an encourager. I'm a huge encourager. I'm a huge proponent of the yay you. Like I will celebrate your wins like I want mine to be celebrated because the more you succeed, you know, the better for all of us, kind of that rising tide raises all ships. So I'm very much of an encourager to the people I'm, I'm working with or leading. And I'm also that kind of inspiration motivator girl. So there's the, you know, not the Nike, just do it, suck it up, but the <laughs> idea of, you know, what can we do? What's the next step? Let's, you know, let's, let's do this. And so there's that idea of motivating and inspiring that I think once we have won the right to be heard through our encouragement, when people know we're for them, it is a much easier to lead well. Mm, absolutely. We will, we're definitely more interested in following the people who believe in us, see us one, mm -hmm. and then believe in us. So that's awesome. All right, Susie, what are you working on right now that you're really excited about that you want to share with us? That's so fun. <laughs> I know. This is a fun question. <laughs> you know, I am actually working on a new program for my, what I call entre spouses. And it is for the group of people who are either in a serious relationship or what I call married with business. And there's a webinar on my site and there's some really fun things coming up because I really do believe that entrepreneurs, marriages and, and important personal relationships really take a hit because we have this other love that we're always taking care of you know, we're sharing our time and energy with, I mean, businesses are exciting and they're emotional and they get us, you know, going in the day, just like our spouse or our loved ones used to. And so there's always that tug of war going on. So the project I'm working on is this program for entre spouses. And right now the kind of teaser is there's a webinar, free webinar on my site. So that I'm very excited about because I've started speaking at more business conferences. I've started being able to say to people who are really succeeding in business, hey, you don't have to do massive action in your personal relationships. But if you do no intentional action, you could lose them. And that is costly emotionally, mentally, financially. And a lot of businesses end because of that. Mm, absolutely. You know, and it's really great that you're hitting on this topic because entrepreneurship is, is really taking off. It's becoming hot. And I'm hearing more and more about spouses who are working together in the business. Ooh. You know, usually it's one person at the forefront and another, the other one is, um, you know, kind of like the supporting actor mm -hmm. or actress, but they are working together and that can put a lot of pressure on a relationship. It can be awesome, mm -hmm. right? If you, but it can also put a lot of pressure. And the, I have a couple of clients that are actually married working in the same business. And I know this, this is something, you know, they're like, we're always together. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And you know, it's interesting because I've done all three. I've worked with my husband um, in his business. He's been an entrepreneur since we got married. I have, he's worked and I've been the stay at home mom. And now we both have our own separate businesses. And so I've done all three and all of them present their own challenges. And I think that's, you know, being willing to say, you know, I talk to a lot of couples and I'm like, you know, we get coaches for the way we, for eating, for exercise, for business, for finances. Why not get some coaching in our relationships so that you can get the right tools to make it easier on you? It doesn't have to be a crisis. I think counselors are like, oh, it's such a crisis versus, you know, let's get some upfront tweaking. Let's get some skills. And that's a huge piece of what I do with people. Mm, and you know what, I, what I've seen out in the world is um, these businesses that have, you know, it's significant others, husband, wife, or life partners, when they are on, right, and they are working together, they're on fire mm -hmm. and unstoppable. So that's huge.
Yeah. All right, Susie, now I'm going to do a quick leadership roundup. So tell us, what is one practice that helps to make you a better leader? I am an avid reader and I'm always looking to learn. So that makes me, I think, helps me be a better leader intrinsically in terms of learning new skills, learning about people, learning about, you know, how people like to be led. Recently, I got a new certification in the DISC training where understanding people and their differences and how they want to be led and how you speak to them really makes a difference. And that is just a huge piece of some people want to be very directed. They want to be, here's what you do. Here's how you do it. Call me when you're done. Some people want to be empowered and go, hey, here's an idea. Run with it. And if you mix those up, you're going to have the person who needed directions feeling lost and unled and the person who needed space and freedom feeling very controlled. So I'm always trying to learn more about what it takes to be a good leader. Mm, I love that too. And I use DISC in my business as well mm -hmm. and in the workshops that I use. And it is life changing for people. It is. And I love the DISC. I've done Myers Briggs, Strength Finder, all the different ones. But DISC is very simple. It's easy to, for people to get and understand. And then my other thing I love about it, I tell all my couples, is it'll cut down about a third of your fights just by, you know. <laughs> yes, I just get by, it. Just by knowing those few things. That's huge. Okay. And knowing you're an avid reader, I'm really interested in your answer to this next question. What is one book that you would recommend to a woman to help her develop her leadership? Okay. You're going to laugh when I tell you this book, because I thought long and hard about this. And the book I'm going to say for the women who are listening to this is a book called Ish, I-S-H <laughs> by Peter Reynolds. And it is a kid's book that my daughter gave me as a gift. And basically it's the story of a creative spirit that starts thinking ishly. This is flower-ish. This is, you know, kind of almost done. This is this is sun-ish. It looks like a sun-ish or this is this is good enough. It's good-ish and that that's far more wonderful than getting it right. And that kind of point um, people might know him from the dot, but there's this idea of and this sounds it good enough, grace, acceptance. So, you know, we are so hard on ourselves as women. And the book Ish really spoke to me because it was like, that's good enough. It's Ish. It's, you know, it's, it, and it, it, they use the analogy of drawing and it spoke to me because I don't feel like I can draw, but there's this idea of this, that's not a vase. And the girl goes, it's vase ish. <laughs> and so I think for women in leadership, we want to get it right. We want to be perfect. We're so worried that we might not, you know, be enough. It's kind of, I'm enough ish, you know, and really letting that perfectionist in us stop running, running the farm. Oh my gosh. Sounds like a fun book. I'm adding it to my list. It's a great book. It's a quick book and it's a, just a, it's just a really fun book. And Susie, knowing what you know now, if given a chance to go back and do anything differently, what would you change? Wow. Um, again, many things. As you get older, you have more regrets. You have more thoughts about what you want to do. Um, two things come to my mind, and I think this goes back to relating to the book. I think I would have given myself more credit where credit was due and more freedom to fail. Because sometimes the fear of failure, I know people talk a lot about the fear of success causing us to sabotage. So that fear really kept me from doing some things, from taking a risk. And those are those, that's something I really, you know, kind of get a do over. Now, the good news for me is people are living longer. So I keep going, oh, I've got, you know, 40, 50 more years to do this. I could <laughs> climb 100. <laughs> Easily. I hope so. Yes, they were saying, I heard, oh my gosh, I'm so bad at like remembering references because I'm like you, I'm like the hair where I'm like, I read mm -hmm. something, I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And I'm off and I'm dashing and I don't write down where I read it or reference it. But I remember reading, it was a science article where they said, we're looking at the first generation where most people will probably live to a hundred or over. I'm so excited about that. Yes. Looking forward to it. Yes. yes. Quality of life, people. Take yes. care of your quality of life Take now. care of your quality of life. Yes. <laughs> All right, Susie, share with us a success quote or a mantra and why it has meaning for you. One of my favorite quotes, I'm a big quote girl. I love them. And on my site, I actually have a shareable Susie kind of link where you can just get graphics and stuff like that for inspiration because I love that idea. One of my favorite ones is... Courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes it's the little voice at the end of the day that says, I will try again tomorrow. And Marianne Rademacher said that, and I have a little, again, sticky of that, to remind me that courage isn't always the big. Sometimes it's just the resilience of, I will try again tomorrow. Oh, I just want to take that in. Can you read it one more time? 
Sure. It says, courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes it's the quiet voice at the end of our day that says, I will try again tomorrow. Mm. That's so in tune with everything you've been saying thus far, too, of giving yourself space, allowing yourself to fail, and give yourself credit where credit is due. I love that. (laughs) Thank you. All right. Lastly, Susie, what is the best way for those listening to connect with you? The best way to connect with me and kind of get all the information you want from me is on my website, susiemiller.com. That's S-U-S-I-E, Miller. M-I-L-L-E-R dot com. And also for your listeners, I'm going to do a special gift where if they go to susiemiller.com forward slash Jody. (gasps) So um, cool. It's so much easier (laughs) than taking the lead. I went back and forth and I was like, women taking the lead. I was like, ah, Jody. Too long. (laughs) susiemiller.com forward slash Jody. There'll also be, you know, just some free gifts, but that's what I would love to do for your listeners. And did you spell it J-O-D-I? I I did. Yay. Okay. So for those listening, Jody is spelled J-O-D-I. No and e, I'm sure all those no will be y. in the show notes, right? Absolutely. And actually, that's what I was just about to say. Sorry? So if you're No, no, no. That's a perfect segue. Because if, if anyone's listening in the car or on the run, don't worry about it. All of the links and resources that you heard in this episode, you can find on womentakingthelead.com or you can use the short link, which is womentl.com. And Susie, thank you so much for taking the time to inspire and enlighten us. We are all better for having met you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It was delightful. Thanks for the work you do in helping women take the lead and be honest about what it's like to be a woman taking the lead. I really, I love your show. I love what you're doing. And I'm so glad we've connected. Thank you for joining me on Women Taking the Lead. Were you inspired to take some action today, but maybe don't know where to start? Or maybe you have so many great ideas you can't decide where to focus your attention. Don't let stress or overwhelm stop you from having the career, the business, or the life you want to live. Head over to womentakingthelead.com forward slash coaching or use the short link womentl.com forward slash coaching to sign up for a consultation with me. And to strengthen you on your leadership journey, I'd like to send you off with a quote from Marianne Williamson. So here goes. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Again, thank you for joining me, and here's to your success.